what would be your advice if the mind is really dull? Like, there are times when I can be so sharp that I could be aware of things in my mind, say, almost every minute, for about three years, then for the next 12 months, the mind is dull. Like, for now, I can feel some joy in my mind to be here, but still, it's really dull. Like, do, do we be aware of the dullness? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Because it's one of the uh, chilesas. And, and also we don't want it, you know, notice, observe the desire to get rid of it. Uh, because, you know, we, we don't like that feeling of, of being confused or dull or sleepy or restless. We don't like that. And so there's a lot of, like, whipple would not have desire to get rid of it. Because I used to want to, you know, I like to get samadhi and feel concentrated, and then and then I get into these very dull samadhi states. I just sit there, and I was there's some kind of samadhi, but it was, certainly wasn't bright, it was dull, but it wasn't so bad. I thought maybe maybe nirvana is just like this, it's just dull. <laughs> Maybe I've attained the bottom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I certainly don't feel very. <laughs> it's not very inspiring, I think. <laughs> but it's not so bad. <laughs> then, you know, more and more as you uh, begin to observe that, because it's like you've got the five kilates and five hindrances, and the third one is the uh, Hinamita and Tattva Kukuta and Wichitita, Tao. And uh, the first two are about greed and anger, and they're exciting, you know, like feeling angry is a very exciting emotion. I used to be the kind, because I was idealistic, uh, indignation. I love to feel angry about the injustices of the world. <laughs> and I could really get a lot of energy out of that, you know. Just, I was used to, in Berkeley, you go around, you know, protesting against unfairness in the society and it says that that also is a, is you know is a form of aversion but it's stimulating and then then uh, lust sexual desire sexual fantasies are stimulating kind of exciting sex and violence and then if when those kind of when you are involved with that then you get tina mita sleepiness dullness restlessness and doubt and uh, then uh, the monastic life is deliberately set out to be boring you know so <laughs> we're not trying to seek excitement or adventure uh, you know monotonous chanting and routine and, and containment of action and speech and so it, it's not because there's a, you know, we're averse to the central world, but it's a, a way of helping us to begin to look at things that we wouldn't look at otherwise. And observe, begin to observe mental states that we may have ignored our whole lives by just seeking excitement or distraction through interesting things or and music and romance, adventure, like cinema, it's all about sex and violence, isn't it? So you have a, one time somebody brought this uh, video to Amravati in England, and, uh, and it was very interesting, you know, a video of this man, he's wearing a white suit, he's a white man wearing a white suit, and he was painting a white wall with white paint. <laughs> it lasted a whole hour before it finished, and you sit there. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, there was no sex, no violence, <laughs> and the movement, you know, was slow, and so it wasn't, you know, there was no even excitement in the movement. This is the most boring video I've ever seen. <laughs> But it, it did fulfill a 
a purpose, you know, a reflection. And you can see, you know, when you go watch a video, you're expecting some kind of action or interest and in something to happen, and then nothing, you know, what's happening there is not interesting or exciting. Not even a color, uh, you know, red or anything, just white. This is the thing to really appreciate about being human is that we have this reflective ability. You know, we can we still suffer like all the other creatures on this planet, you know, and, and old age, sickness, death, and so forth, survival, fear, but we have the ability to reflect on it, and that's what the Buddha, what Buddha really means, our ability to to observe. It doesn't mean we, if we're really mindful, we, we, we never get old or sick or anything, but it means that we can observe the changing process, our relationship to, to condition phenomena changes from ignorance and identity to observing it in, in what it really is, it's changing in the you know, its nature is impermanence, change. So, so the Buddha point out, all conditions are impermanent. The faith and Karanicha. And then carry that reflection through everything from the most coarse condition to the most refined. You know, it's just a refined mental moment or or just coarse things that, you know, the changing of the seasons, or rain, it, it rains and then the sun comes out, just observing change on that level, but also it applies to all conditioned phenomena, whether it's mental, emotional, psychic, physical, you know, so it includes the sun and moon, the stars, as well as everything that, you know, in your own body, and uh, energies and uh, that you experience through the body and uh, through the senses, and whether it's you know refined or coarse, good, bad, right or wrong, it's, it's nature is all uh, anicca, and that that makes it very easy for us because we don't have to sort out the sankharas to try to get rid of the bad ones and hold on to the good ones. We can, our relationship to, to Sankara, the conditioned phenomena, is observing it, not judging it. And then we, then we, uh, we use a vehicle like uh, Donna Sila as a way of, of containing our actions and speech in a way that is skillful and, and helps us to be more mindful and develop, uh, you know, more a sense of self-respect and and, uh, uh, and 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 have as much happiness in the world as you can through through being responsible for action and speech, and then uh, then the benefits even on the worldly level are you know if you keep the five precepts then at least you you'll find you you kind of respect yourself for doing that you feel a sense of I'm a worthy person, and then people will trust you, too. And people will begin to see you as somebody they can trust and respect. But if you're a murderer, a liar, sexually promiscuous, irresponsible, uh, a thief, and a drunkard, not all. <laughs> Nobody will respect you, including yourself. And, uh, and then, you know, then the misery of that, of just having no self-respect and nobody trusting him. But, and, you know, so, like in Buddhism, the, the basis is this Dhamma Sila, which, which is, uh, it's not like a commandment that Buddha says you have to keep the five precepts, it's like, uh, giving you this occasion, like to take the five precepts, you have to ask three times. You know, we're, monks were forbidden to 
course, the five precepts are, you know, against our discipline, you know, you take the five precepts, or else, don't ever come to this monastery again. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, it's like, it's also very, uh, it, it helps us to grow up, to, to not just be good because we're frightened of being punished. It's because we, we, we love the good, we want to be responsible for how we live, you know, we're, we're maturing as, as a human beings for one day. And then, uh, and then from that the bhavana begins to, uh, you know, have benefits in our meditation practice. So you've got this dana sila bhavana theory. And it's the kind, you know, in Thailand, it's just, you hear that all the time in any village monastery or school, they talk about dana sila bhavana. But also, a reflection, that is a very, you know, useful paradigm to hold in your mind and to reflect on, you know. When you, when you give, like, uh, tambu, when you generous to being generous, then also you can reflect on, on the, the result of being generous is like this. You know, so in, you know, like at Amarvati in England, where, where you have uh, a lot of, you know, Thai, Sri Lankan, and Lao and Cambodian people coming from the Asian, from Buddhist countries, and then you've got a lot of British and European coming there, and like on a Sunday where people, you know, are free to, they're not working, then it's just a kind of joyful atmosphere that the Asians bring, because they all come to give the tambun, and to, to give dana, and uh, and it's kind of, uh, you know, they've got, and they just, they, they never ask for anything back, you know, about it quid pro quo kind of thing, it's, it's, they'd love to do this, so so you get a kind of uh, joyous atmosphere there. And then the Europeans start picking up on it. Because <laughs> the, the Western minds aren't, aren't trained to do that. We want to get enlightened through meditation. <laughs> they come to learn meditation to get enlightened. <laughs> So they're quite diligent in one sitting <laughs> doing that, going on retreat. But also, you know, it's that that's good, you know, that's not to be criticized, but this whole this these three levels are equally important. The Dana Sila Pawana. When I meditate and practice and I found anger arise easily and when I know it that it's already arise it's very strong I know it, I'm aware of it but it will stay for some time hours without react and then later it's gone, it's like completely gone but at that time when the anger is there and you're aware and you try to let it go. After that, it's very tiring. So I don't know how to deal with it. Well, with that, just sometimes you feel you've got to look at it and do something with it. Uh, but uh, letting go of it just means don't make a problem about it. And then, like in meditation, you like this happens a lot. Like when, when I first started meditating, when I was a Samanera, and I I lived in in, in a monastery in Nongkai for a year, and they and the first three months, it was like this Kao Hong practice. You go into Kuti and. And you just stay there. And uh, I didn't talk to anybody or anything, so I was with myself all the time. 
and and I was trying to, I was hoping to be tranquilized, you know, to live in a state of bliss. And uh, but instead, the first three months was just anger, un unrelenting anger, and it wasn't due to anything in the monastery. I mean, they were treating me very well. It was, it was just, you know, I was 31 and I'd repressed anger in my, you know, from early childhood. You were punished for being angry. My parents were, you know, said it's wrong and you shouldn't be angry and things like that. So I, I'd learned how to repress it. And then in that particular situation, uh, where you you don't have anything to do, and you you just you bring in you brought a meal in the morning, and then you don't have any friends to talk, you don't have a telephone, or television, or anything. You're just by yourself all the time, and you know no have no way to escape, and the repressive techniques don't work anymore. You just have to sit there and let it happen. So actually, that's what I did. I just I gave up trying to stop it or change it, or but just allowed it to arise because it's like something repressed, and then it it starts coming, reaching consciousness. So see that as liberating, yeah, actually. Rather than meditating badly, you're actually purifying it. You're like, like repressed resentments, fears, angers arise. And it's like a cleansing. You're letting them go so they go away from you. If you try to stop them, then you're, you're repressing them again. So then, you know, it's like the prisoners want to get out of the prison. They're yelling and... The, and then you open the door and they come out, but what you see is just frightening and terrible, so you slam the door on them, then they, they're locked back in to create more problems. But if you open the prison gate, let the prisoners out, they go away. <laughs> they don't come back. <laughs> so look at it more like that. <laughs>